In many cases, nonprofit programs from the Maynard Institute to the McCormick Fellows Program have been there to help the news business live up to its commitments for a representative workforce and coverage. There has been a lot of progress in a lot of areas, and one of those is media. I think that uh, media has become <coughs> uh, less segregated. You know, some of there are scores now successful African American. Uh, journalists and people of color who have influenced media but even with that more needs to be done all the progress we've made and I think we've made substantial progress in 40 years we're a long way uh, from a colorblind society I know that that newsrooms get a lot of flack for not having moved the needle you know these low these many years but if you walk into a metro newsroom today and if you could walk into a metro newsroom of 1968 or 1969 I think you would find a tremendous difference not just in the way it looks but in how the editors and reporters think there was, there was a great scrambling to achieve many of these uh, laudable goals uh, in pursuit of diversity for a long time you know the 70s and the 80s and then it reached its zenith and suddenly it's it's all changing I think there have been many marked improvements for people of color in the newsroom you ha we have to acknowledge that we now have editors publishers news directors anchors all wonderful developments for people of color and that's a wonderful positive thing to see the whole issue of diversity the tone seems to have changed. While it were, was a main mantra, I'd say in the 80s, late 80s and early 90s, it's rarely discussed in a lot of newsrooms today. It is rarely discussed. I think those pressures are wringing the motivation of our diversity out of those, of, of those who are responsible for it, running those industries. I think standing up and making speeches or promoting diversity after a while is people don't want to hear it they want to make money in most major newsrooms i'm a, a rarity there are very few african-american managing editors and editors and i'm kind of on one hand actually we all know each other the proof is in the numbers of people they employ the proof is in their ability to retain those folks and move them into increasing levels of responsibility and in that way most media organizations don't even get into d I can't tell you the number of times I heard people say, I'd love to hire them, but I can't find them. They don't want to work here. We don't pay enough money. They'd rather be in television. Bah, 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 bah. Well, I say bullshit, uh, and it is bullshit. News organizations and America have witnessed a lot of changes over 40 years, but challenges remain. Could it be that those who refuse to learn the lessons from the past are doomed to repeat it? Basically, I'm an optimist, but I do worry sometimes that because we didn't, full, we didn't listen to ourselves when we knew that there was a problem, not only in terms of, uh, of staffing, but in impro providing coverage, that we've basically sort of written our fate. I think the struggles that were back in the newsrooms in 68 are pretty much essentially the same as they are now not enough representation, not enough accuracy, not enough self-determination, not enough understanding the demographic change and the fact that inclusiveness in diversity is good for business and it's good for audience and readership and listenership. I also have a sense that I'm not sure I've made that big a difference, nor can I, because I still feel like a bunch of old white men are running the industry, and it's really not going to change that much until they go away. And I don't think they're going away, to be quite honest and candid. You know, we don't own the companies, but we certainly uh, work in them and can have an influence in them, and I think that we have to, we have to keep the fight going. I, I see a lot more native publications. I see a lot more native radio stations websites, newsletters that report on, you know, the true story because what we hear is not because I don't think apathy anymore, is that I don't understand Native issues. There are a lot of wonderful, good people who are not people of color who 
are out there fighting the fight as tough as we are, as hard as we are. By that same token, for everyone that's out there fighting the fight, who really gets it, who's trying to make diversity happen, who tries to run a fair and balanced newsroom, there's one out there who does not get it. Forty years later, we're still, we still dance around the topic of racial issues. Um, we're not doing the in-depth kind of coverage. If we give up hope, then there's no reason for me to be in the business. I think there's still suspicion um, in our community uh, with regards to the media. Um, and uh, all too often, um, the, the depiction or the stereotypes still show up on the uh, evening news. A realization that you no longer live in a mostly white America. And a realization that nobody's going to buy the newspaper if they can't use it. And if they don't see themselves in it, they can't use it. As, as unity brings together journalists of color, I think there needs to be statements and, uh, and a renewed commitment to push uh, our leaders in the media and to understand that this is not about social engineering, this is not being a good guy, this is about serving, fulfilling their jobs as journalists. What we want to do uh, on this anniversary of the current commission, 40 years later, is to help people see that uh, the, the intertwined problems of race and poverty are still with us. Uh, and uh, to get around this myth that grew up during the Reagan administration that everything we tried uh, failed. The truth is that everything we tried is virtually everything worked. Uh, we just stopped trying it. Uh, or uh, we stopped trying it hard enough.